So Renata, uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here in Berlin because uh, now, uh, these days, I'm living in Chile, which is like really, really, really far away. And as my day job, I direct this office uh, most, mostly uh, by women. Uh, women work at, at my office, 85 percent are women uh, of the staff. And we are trying to, we used to develop technology for public good, and now we are kind of shifting the, the uh, and we are in a profound process of being critical of the work we do uh, uh, on and on, in, in two offices in the Global South on what is our role uh, as civil society in, at the intersection of technology and democracy. And a um, few days um, ago I was giving a talk in, in Santiago and I asked a question that I will ask all of you. Who is born in this century, in this room? Uh, <laughs> it was quite amazing and, and, and it, it indicative of how different our world is because in, in that random tech conference uh, in Chile, uh, most of the people in the room were born after 2000. So uh, it, it is uh, the demographics, if, if you think uh, on this changing world with complex crises, uh, like the if you look at Africa and Latin America and vast parts of Asia, most of the people, they were born after 9-11. Uh, uh, they were born, they, many of them, and it's incredible the lack of awareness that we, we have in young generations, and I don't want to sound like a grandma of the internet, but uh, young generations, many of them are not even aware that when they were born, uh, uh, new wars were starting not only the Iraq war, Afghanistan war, but also a war about privacy. So many of the people today, young people today, starting to use technology and starting to use products like Nextcloud, they, we, we might, uh, we were the ones that kind of taking rights for, for granted. Uh, they, many of them, take the erosion of the rights for granted. And so that's um, why I wanted to this, this talk is, is going to be a little bit long. I will try to cover a lot of time. I will try to cover a decade. And I will try to cover different moments when I think that we were still somehow in charge of technology and how we failed in tackling issues that only got bigger and bigger and bigger um, uh, um, through time. I'm writing a book about digital colonialism. And as you can see here on the ups and downs, uh, uh, we are uh, heading to in a, in a quite dangerous path. Um, um, I would like to arrive at, at the last last bit of this. There, I, I hope that the, the, this talk will help me conduct you through these all these phases, because uh, next year is a crucial year. Uh, next year is a uh, is a year where a big conference is going to take place and. It is not being discussed enough, and it is not in mainstream media, and it's not socialized through our circles. But uh, many of you, I mean, you might be familiar with the World Trade Organization. And the World Trade Organization will celebrate a big ministerial meeting next year, and they will uh, start discussing our issues. Uh, the future of uh, e-commerce, technology, privacy, and all of that. And there's a big, big, big push to, to basically consolidate a, a set of rules that would make practically impossible to buy back and practically impossible to uh, re-democratize technology for people. And so, uh, bear with me, I know that will be like a, a little bit long, uh, our conversation today, but I want to, uh, and I, I'm not a pessimist, I'm optimist, I, I think that we can fight this back and I think that we can make the changes that we need but we need to be very careful and look at the mistakes we made in the last 10 years. Uh, so we will look at the things that we celebrated that were not motives of celebration, and things were, that were so overwhelming and so upsetting that, uh, that was like, kind of, as a society, paralyzed and 
fragmented and, and not really fighting back. So um, I, I, I have separated, as I said, in different uh, periods from 2009 to 2012. I call it the, the unexpected development from 2013 to 2015, the crisis of trust. Uh, then 16 uh, to 19, uh, the digital despots consolidation. And then uh, 2019, the task uh, where we are going to hopefully have a conversation on how we fight back. So this was an unexpected, really an unexpected interruption. Uh, the massive leak of uh, diplomatic cables, uh, a, a massive publication by a big coalition of organizations, <coughs> but also the collateral murder video, but also, and um, I don't want to be US EU centric, but also all the emergence of uh, independent journalists and uh, whistleblowers blowing the whistle up, just publishing everything online. Um, this was the Pirate Bay, was also a disruption, and um, um, it was a disruption in a different way. It was uh, played by <coughs> our rules instead of played by the rules that a system that was anachronic and a system that was, was completely outdated and not reflecting the values of people uh, was uh, kind of imposing on us. And this is a mix that are upstream. I am not sure if it was uh, a disruption to celebrate or, or a disruption to be uh, cautious in our optimism about. Um, it, it is interesting because, because if you compare this picture of the Arab Spring and the telephones and everyone being the broadcaster of their own revolution and you, you see what happened next and we know what ha happened next. Syria happened next uh, and lots of other conflicts happened next. And I think that uh, we, if, we, if we go back to, uh, to, the, to the mistakes we made, first uh, in here with WikiLeaks, Oops. Ah. Yeah. We, we, the re revelations of Chelsea Manning and we WikiLeaks, we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, one of the mistakes, uh, like, I think that the most, uh, as a lawyer who was very closely involved in the case, I think that the most important mistake that we didn't, uh, we didn't tackle was the increased role of private companies in censorship and the politicization of censorship uh, with a phone call to a company by Washington. It was a series of attacks. It was technical attacks, financial attacks, physical attacks, surveillance. It was overwhelming for the people involved. But uh, I remember when the diplomatic cables started being published and uh, you know, Amazon servers did, uh, kicked out, uh, like Amazon, uh, the, uh, the DNS company, uh, PayPal, all these companies, the reaction, the politicized reaction, but a, a imperialist reaction to the WikiLeaks publication, it was not, uh, I think that we didn't get upset enough. We were more upset about the revelations published by the, by the journalists, and by the, by the attempts, like open attempts at, at uh, assassination threats and, and, and all of that, then uh, as a civil society, we saw it as an isolated issue because it really caught uh, the State Department by surprise and a lot of powerful people by surprise. And they, they reacted in a very, I think that, I think that the, the most interesting thing is that they reacted in a very transparent way. They showed the re real colors, they showed that when Washington is upset about something, the private sector is uh, is an extension of this very uh, of the most powerful army in the world, basically, and it will do as Washington says. And I think that uh, that mistake, not fighting back, not litigating, not exposing how awful that was, how centralized our systems were, how dependent our freedom of speech. It was uh, of um, um, how, let, let's say, how vulnerable our um, descent was to the wishes of American companies. 
I, I think that that was, uh, um, we neglected that very basic thing and it only in the next 10 years is really got worse as we, ha we can see now. Good, good things that were uh, of that time um, and is a reflection I have been thinking a, a lot of is uh, that censorship was visible and tangible. So when, when your enemy is visible and tangible, you can fight, fight it back. Censorship was a blocked a block website, a page that wouldn't uh, load. Uh, today, and as we as we will see, censorship is getting like more ubiquitous, more intangible, more um, arbitrary, and less and less accountable. And I remember when when I, when I was working on digital rights at that time we could uh, point at the censor. We could, and we will more or less know the reasons of the censorship. It was a government, it was uh, sometimes private sector for copyright claims, but nowadays it's more difficult. If a word disappears from, us, if, if it's dif really difficult to access information, we sometimes do, do not know the reasons behind that. Well, then uh, we had the crisis of trust and the chilling, effects, the chilling effects attached to that crisis of trust. And we also had something very interesting that was not that present in our lives, probably in the lives of Germans, yes, but not in the rest of the world. Uh, 2014 was a key year when most of the people all over the world access the internet via telephones. Like it, it, it was more likely that you will access the internet via a mobile phone than by a computer. And that really changed everything. And that really changed not only the commodification of people and people's data, but also uh, the architecture, uh, the, the dominant architecture of the way we connect. And I, I really, really, really like, and, and you, I, I think that you cannot see everything, but I will, yeah. I really, really like this slide is um, by uh, Johai Benkler. And Johai Benkler, I think that he dislikes mobile phones as much as I dislike mobile phones because the, uh, the utopian, interoperable, democratic internet I loved in the decade before uh, was of computers and was of the promise of interoper interoperability and was of the promise of anyone uh, not only creating things for profit but also creating things for public good. And in, on a mobile phone, uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, not sometimes, most of the time, everything is for profit, everything is closed, and two big actors control the markets. And as we have seen in this year with the Huawei uh, conflict, it is really, it is, it is not only um, a market issue, it's a political issue as well. Um, well, this is, uh, I mean, if I was speaking to, to my uh, art uh, students uh, in Santiago, I will have to go and speak what the spectrum means or what DRM means with this audience. It's quite easy to go quickly through this. But it is a good reflection on, on how each and every bit of a mobile phone is uh, impossible to, to open, basically. And I, I shared uh, with these students uh, an anecdote when I was in Guatemala, when I was a little girl, uh, part of my computer classes was to uh, basically open our computer, see what was inside, clean the keyboard, clean piece by piece the keyboard, and then put it back together. And now kids, they cannot do that with a telephone. I mean, good luck and they cannot see what's running on the telephone and they cannot, I mean, the, the devices. Uh, I remember that my grandmother used to say, oh yes, you young people know about technology and you understand how it operates. And I think that we have to stop telling ourselves that lie because I think that from 2014 on, we don't, we no longer, we do not, we, we have been removed from the right a right has been taken away from us, and that's another fight that we didn't vote enough. 
a right has been taken away from us, not only as consumers, as people, as people learning and, and as people trying to uh, improve what, uh, what and adapt uh, the technologies we we have. It's okay. Ah, okay. Uh, we 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 do not have any more the ability to um, play and and tinker and do things, and that's especially important because uh, with uh, with young people, I mean, that's the future. The future is a future that of lack of accountability of the devices they use and the cars they use and all the thi all all the nightmare to come with uh, 5G. Um, I really like this um, quote by Shoshana Zuboff because basically, as we have seen, uh, as we have seen, and uh, as we will see later in my slides, every digital application that can be used for surveillance and control will be used for surveillance and control. And yeah, I think that this was uh, the crisis of trust uh, of 2013, and then it continued to 2014. And it continues. It, it doesn't seem to stop. Uh, on when when it became clear, like with the WikiLeaks thing, we we had like a um, just um, a little uh, test, uh, and then we really experienced this uh, um, marriage between uh, companies and intelligence agencies. And I think that that uh, uh, changed but not enough, uh, I think that we took the wrong path there. I think that uh, we, people who understood the dimensions of what was going on, we really uh, went on the defense, on encryption and uh, privacy enhancing technologies, on uh, try to, tr to cover the camera on the machine, try to instead of fighting back and saying this is unacceptable and saying we are going to abandon these services that we are going to advocate for our governments to stop using these services and these companies should go bankrupt because they betrayed people, we went on the, okay, this is inevitable, let's just protect us, we privileged people that, can, uh, that know and understand encryption and let's go and hide and not fight. And the result, I, I wrote a paper, and it's, it's really devastating, the paper, because these guys are so intelligent, so intelligent, that what they did be, between 2013 and 2016 was to reform most of the laws from most of the countries to legalize what they were doing and to justify what they, they were doing uh, on their uh, national security arguments. And that was our failure, because uh, if I look at Europe, while everyone was like, uh, like we, with a good fight uh, with the GDPR, all these legal reforms, they, it, it was like super rapid, okay, terrorist attack here, and next week the law was being discussed and approved without uh, much public scrutiny or ability to change the things. And that, of course, it, it, it not only happened in here, but I think that uh, Europe was the real change maker, and Europe was the the continent that could. Uh, it, it, the difference uh, that of treatment on this, if instead uh, European citizens, instead of using all this crap, were using now by law and under national security arguments, European-made uh, technology that is more more accountable and more independent from the telephone in Washington situation will be different. It's important that we reflect... <laughs> no, it's important that we reflect on this because we must not allow this to happen again. And with the 5G technology, we have a, there's an opportunity, a window of opportunity there. These devices that will pollute our cities, basically. And well, uh, I think that we owe a lot to this person and we do not thank him enough. And we, we, we need to make, it, uh, and I am glad that he's publishing his book soon. I mean, it's already out. Because it will bring back to the table these topics. Because they kind of vanished. Uh, Cambridge Analytica, blah, distracted us completely from, from 2016. And it's an important issue, but those issues here a very, very important, and, and here it's not even included infrastructure. 
And we, I think that we need to really uh, uh, continue the pending conversation and, and challenge those laws being passed. Um, uh, this is a global issue, uh, as we saw with the ex key score. And this is so outdated. I cannot imagine uh, right now the government, like uh, led by uh, Pompeo, Bolt, well, Bolton is gone, but <laughs> horrible people in Washington who really like to undermine people's rights. Imagine how vast, it, it, we don't have a whistleblower, a whistleblower jet exposing how uh, the surveillance under the Trump era is, is, is taking place, but I, I imagine that if this was happening during uh, Obama administration, I can only imagine what's happening now. And well, uh, the next period I want to look at was uh, the one that I, I described, uh, like digital despots uh, against citizens. And I think that the point that marked the beginning of this era is uh, when uh, these uh, data lords, they start trying to be the ones uh, connecting uh, the next billion. And I re maybe you were not exposed to this blah, but in countries, in, in continents like Latin America, Asia, and Africa, it was all about, oh yes, Facebook will provide internet for the poor children on the half of the continent, or uh, Google will provide this cable to African governments to be able to connect to the internet. And it was a, a, a time of empty promises of connectivity that will solve everything. And um, it also, um, it, it was more open, the colonial attitude of Silicon Valley, uh, Silicon Valley companies through, uh, I remember that uh, before, okay, you will have uh, these keynotes by the Silicon Valley people uh, in, tech conferences, but then you, I, I started seeing a trend of Mark Zuckerberg meeting the president of Brazil, or uh, the people at Google meeting, uh, I mean, basically Silicon Valley was slowly moving closer, openly, because they were doing it before, closer to do, to be uh, this sort of tech ambassadors. To, to do, I, I remember uh, uh, Eric Schmidt visiting Cuba and North Korea. So it was weird because so you, you, as a company, you're supposed to provide a service and you're supposed to serve your customers. You're not supposed to uh, be political ambassadors to Cuba or North Korea. And bringing the products, uh, and offering the products uh, to uh, these uh, countries in the global south, key countries, powerful countries. It was a lot, it looked a lot like when the Spanish arrived in Latin America and we were offering these little mirrors uh, to, to, <laughs> to, uh, to the locals. I, I, I find, I, we found, found it abusive and we found it uh, completely unacceptable. But yeah, we will find out later the, the, the close relationship with politics as well. And yeah, <laughs> I love that picture. And, and yeah, it, it is so terrible, you know, that after this conference, I'm heading to the strategy meeting of Oxfam. And Oxfam, Oxfam International is one of the organizations tackling inequality all over the world. And in order to connect and be able to participate in the in the conference, I had to create a Facebook account. And I was like, no, no, this is all that's wrong in the world. And they told me, well, the only way we can connect many of our staffers in developing countries is through Facebook. Facebook is the internet. And it started much earlier. It was a combination of austerity plans, of lack of, 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 lack of uh, awareness of what was going on and lack of, uh, lack of uh, I mean, laziness of government. Laziness of governments. Uh, uh, it, uh, usually what happened was that a public service got privatized. In the case of the internet, it never, it never made it to be a public utility, a public service. And I think that that was another of the mistakes that we made. And it is, it can still be corrected in half of the world because 50% of the population is still not connected. So how we connect half of humanity will define everything in the future. 
Um, I like her a lot. Uh, Nerida Cifuentes is, uh, that was happening, and these small resistance were happening as the data lords were imposing themselves. Uh, she is a parliamentarian, actually she's on leave from parliament, but she's uh, one of the youngest parliamentarians in Bolivia. And she's a, uh, Nerida Cifuentes is a free software activist and now is the minister of infrastructure in the country. And um, I really, really, really like uh, her approach because it's an approach that I have found, sadly, uh, in, in Europe doesn't happen much. It's still it's slowly happening, but uh, these uh, many of the decisions related to infrastructure and related to uh, the tools that government uses and so on are decided uh, are political decisions. And if we do not get our people inside politics, that will never happen. So uh, it's, it's just a parenthesis uh, on, I mean, she she's very young and she has done so much and she, she doesn't have a formal education and so on. Imagine all the things that you could achieve inside politics. Uh, it's, a, it's a, a moment of reflection. Maybe for the next elections you will participate. Anyway, because if you don't participate, people more stupid and people more like completely reckless and with a crisis of morale are going to take power and are going to take all the decisions. And that's another of the reflections and that's another of the reasons why I'm, I'm kind of upset with Europe. Now, most of the companies used by European citizens are in a jurisdiction uh, vulnerable to the volatile uh, decisions of this person and his team. And uh, digital despots are not, uh, do not work on isolation. They work closely with the politicians in charge. And I guess that uh, for big uh, tech companies is uh, much easier to deal with someone who cares about the issues and the problems of the 1% than the issues and the problem of the people. So it's a political problem, the problem that we... Okay, and it's not going... Ah, uh, this, I mean, all the CEOs of the tech companies also highlights another problem. Who is not in the room? Apart from women, who are not in the room and is, is one of the problems that I, I didn't highlight from the beginning, but is, it is as 50% of the humanity is disconnected, I, I guess that 50% of humanity is being excluded from the process of creating technology, of testing the technologies and on, on, on fixing this, uh, this uh, uh, business model we, uh, of, of data extractivism that we are into. But it is not only that 50% of the population, women, are excluded from the po not only the politics, but also the, the process of developing these technologies. It's also that those who are not in the room are, are often minorities, are often uh, vulnerable people whose uh, interests are not taken into account on this. And Another important thing is uh, the close collaboration that has become like very visible of these digital despots with uh, the military. But what I also want to highlight is our role as users using uh, constantly these kind of technologies. We are like basically uh, in the process of perfectioning a killing machine. And this is very close to my heart because I'm Central American and as you, you might not be aware, but a similar crisis to the crisis uh, of uh, uh, refugees that uh, Germany had in 2015 is going on now in the US. And as Shoshana was saying, that every technology that can be used uh, for surveillance and control will be used for surveillance and, co and control. That's happening now with uh, migrant workers in uh, the US. Uh, uh, illegal, illegal, according to the U.S. Uh, jurisdiction, Palantir, Amazon, all these companies are participating close, closely in something like is, is basically the torture and persecution of poor people who the only intention is to work and to earn a decent living. 
uh, if you consider that uh, thanks to free trade agreements and bad politics and uh, interventions and so on, the uh, living wage of a campesino in Guatemala is probably below 100 euro a month. And you uh, and it is uh, the Central American cities are among the most dangerous cities in the world. Uh, level of violence compared to the level of uh, of violence of a country at war, then it's no surprise that they go to the U.S. And uh, it is it, for me it's really heartbreaking to see that. Uh, technology is being taken away from the hands of them. Basically, uh, social media, Facebook, and all of that, they are doing data scrapping to... And that's the only way that they stay connected with the community and their families that they leave behind. And, they, and this uh, ICE is using data scrapping to identify and to locate uh, illegal migrants. And... The uh, Palantir and Amazon and so on are making these efficient refugee camps, re refugee jails, and it, it is this close collaboration of a, a repressive government and unethical uh, technology companies. At this is becoming more visible. So when we we buy their products, we are like kind of assisting um, the persecution of uh, vulnerable communities, and. Let me stop here for a second. I'm almost at the end. But, um, you know, very close from Germany, in Turkey, a journalist was chopped into pieces. And that we failed. We completely failed. Uh, this journalist was kidnapped, tortured, and, you know, tra treated with the most inhuman, uh, by the most inhuman treatment. And we didn't protest enough. I think that this was one of the most outrageous situations that happened recently. And I think that that, that move our level of, we are so desensitized. And that um, why this is relevant for a tech uh, conference? It is relevant for a tech conference because this person was uh, being subject uh, of uh, heavy electronic surveillance. But it is also relevant because the, the uh, perpetrators of this crime are heavily involved in the funding of tech companies, the Saudis. And so I, I, I have heard, and there are big scandals on ethics uh, in the tech community, but these ethics, <laughs> these, the, the serious conversations and the very heavy conversations, we are not having these conversations. And I... I think that the, the moment that now has passed with that, but we should not, we should be more angry and outraged, and we should be more uh, careful on the on on analyzing who's be, who's really behind uh, the tech companies of today. Incre um, well, we are going through crisis. Crisis from crisis, uh, the deep fakes, debate, and all of that. We don't have tools to deal with that. Um, now, the new threats and a legal battle that changes everything. I think that the new threats, as I was saying, uh, the biggest threat I see is the consolidation through trade agreements and through security agreements of the power of the big tech companies. And... TTP, uh, uh, TPP and TISA uh, were like big fights. And we came out of those also. The copyright directive last year was a complete disaster. I mean, we lost. Uh, this battle is not only European, the one that, that is coming. And the next generation of trade agreements, what they want to consolidate is that our inability, uh, like w they want to block our right as citizens to open the black box. And that's very serious. Uh, if, uh, if a trade agreement kind of crystallizes the opacity of algorithms, and if a trade agreement restricts our abil ability to um, ad advocate for open and democratic uh, uh, automated uh, decision making, we are going to be like basically the slaves of the black box. And I think that uh, 
these trade topics are very com complicated because when you advocate against some issues and against some against uh, some provisions inside those, you're often labeled as uh, anti-development or anti-economic uh, growth, and that that really really will require a lot of creativity and a lot of technical knowledge. Uh, democratize technical knowledge uh, and you have a role to play on that um, to to make the general public realize the importance of that you know how technology works you you still know how technology works and you still know how the technology works inside the black box and how and, and the dangers uh, behind that and the lack the lack of what uh, can drive uh, if there's no ac accountability on that if we don't fight that fight, it's going to be, be very, very complicated to win. But another, and, and the, that, that's the political battle. Uh, the other battle is the climate crisis. And we do not talk enough about that in these kind of settings. We need, not, we need to, in parallel of uh, um, develop, developing human-centric, rights-preserving technologies, we need to start uh, developing in parallel, and, and it has to go together. Technolo we need to change the attitude of using technology all the time for all the reasons and uh, keep uh, wasting and polluting the world. We need to re-examine and uh, start developing technologies that also take care of the planet. And <laughs> and well, and last but not least, uh, I think that this um, cannot be done and people cannot be outraged if there's not responsible journalism and responsible uh, and, and enough knowledge of what's going on behind closed doors. So I think that this um, battle of the, extra, of the current uh, persecution and prosecution of Chelsea Manning because of refusing to talk against a journalist and the extradition of someone just because of publishing public interest information changes everything. Um, I know that Julian is a controversial figure, but it's not about him. It is about the, it is about the charges. Uh, the charges now that he's facing, and uh, not only him, but uh, other journalists involved with it, uh, names are like redacted is because of the publication of information on 2010 that revealed crimes against humanity. If an investigative journalist that was not doing his work from uh, US even and that did what any other journalist was doing on scrutinizing the most powerful uh, government in the world is extradited because of that and faces uh, a life in prison the chilling effect will be very, very powerful. And the recriminalization of a source, the recriminalization of someone who blew the, who blew the whistle is, uh, is something abusive. And again, uh, as in the case of Jamal Khashoggi, we are not angry enough. We tend to forget. It was 10 years ago, so it, it seems so far away. It seems so far away, but if we have this kind of people in charge, and we cannot blow the whistle against them without facing life in prison. If a whistle, blowing the whistle d doesn't become a citizen exercise as frequent and as, as, as common as uh, requesting uh, access to public information, then, and on top of that, uh, uh, the companies achieve opacity of the algorithms, then we are going to be in serious trouble. So that's... That's all. Thank you so much. And happy to take some questions or comments. Yeah, um, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. I will bring you the, the microphone. Oh, I, maybe I can just like repeat the question.
So the, the question is, uh, the, so, uh, the question is um, basically, since uh, there are like so uh, different, uh, well, approaches in South America and Europe, and that old people don't make revolutions, I'm just quoting, uh, what, what can you expect from us? I th I'm sorry, uh, did I get the question right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me bring in the microphone. Alors que c'est pas nous qui allons faire la révolution. <laughs> so I try uh, once again. Uh, basically, what are you proposing us to to to, to choose to uh, which kind of acts? Uh, what are the next step steps, practical steps for uh, people in Europe? Uh, we are edge edge people. There is a lot of uh, older people in Europe compared to South America, and I was quoting that uh, older people don't make revolution anymore. Uh, we don't have the energy to do that. So basically what we have to do to uh, revolt ourselves against those injustices when we are in our comfort, we have money, and basically we just want others to let us in peace. That, 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 that's a very tricky... I mean, I, I think that Europe didn't learn from its history, you know, and it's, it makes me really upset. And all people make revolutions, actually. Uh, if you read all the stories of the resistance and the partisans, I, I, there were like entire communities and, and networks of uh, solidarity that helped the revolution happen. And I think that it's not about age and it's not about comfort. It's about being European and what makes you European. And I think that the doing nothing is abdicating to uh, European values. And what can you do? I think that... First thing, vote better. If there's not uh, good options to vote at, then become the option. Uh, if uh, you can only uh, change things with your wallet, then allocate your money in a wise manner in products that are ethical and that are changing things. Um, I, I think that I think sometimes you can make a lot just offering you know, offering a little bit of time to put your knowledge at the service of people. Uh, for example, when, when, and when this is happening, when these big negotiations on trade issues and technology are taking place, even taking the moment to write a one-pager explaining why something that you think that is wrong on the, on the text is wrong and sharing it with one of the negotiators of one of the Global South countries. There are many, many ways to, to contribute. I think that uh, inaction is not an option. And I think that uh, you, you have to be creative and find ways to contribute. Uh, inaction is really not an option at this moment in history. If not, you will be complicit. Um, one one of my favourite movements is Grannies Against Fracking. It's really worth checking out. Um, a granny and a police officer, it's not a good look. They're powerful. <laughs> um, as, as a privileged European, I feel a lot of responsibility to act. Um, I also know that it's inappropriate to represent Latin America, Africa, and pr pretend that my voice or our voice is theirs. What, how can we make sure that this is a global movement? How can we expand and make sure that this is not only for Europeans? Well, I think that, I, think that, I mean, there are many options, and I think that you don't, you don't, repre you don't rep you represent an underrepresented, and, and you, you represent women. And the voice of women can have different faces. And, and I think that the... I th I think that we need to inform ourselves better on what's going on around the world, and we need we need to be aware of what's going globally and act locally. And many of the things happening, I mean, be very strategic. Uh, the the European Parliament has, for example, a big role on what's going on in Africa and Latin America, and they can change things for good. So, a gesture of global solidarity is to act at least that your locals <laughs> do not harm, harm uh, abroad. Uh, I think that we are still, we have all the tools, but we do not have the architecture of a global solidarity movement in place. 
And I think that we need to think deeply about that and how how is going to look um, propaganda part, commercial. We are putting together uh, something called the uh, Progressive International. And those are the questions precisely that we have been asked. The, the movement was launched uh, in New York last year with uh, Bernie Sanders and Yanis Varoufakis and people like Ada Colau, Naomi Klein, all the people talking about the issues. But this is the question that we are still like struggling with. How not to leave people out do we want it to be like English speakers only? Do we want it to, how are we going to connect? Is, will it only be like, you know, elites? How can we really connect with movements? And how are we going to decide the things? But we often, you know, we uh, on the good side uh, are, par uh, are paralyzed by the analysis and we want everything perfect. If you look at the other side, they have the, the nationalist, international is functioning pretty well across borders and languages. The big push for nationalism of, and, and, and increased race on, on uh, these uh, nasty politics, that's happening like very organically because they don't stop and think about these kind of things. So I think that we just have to do it and it's going to be imperfect and we will make mistakes and people will be excluded but we can fix it in the process. What we, can, we cannot afford anymore is to keep thinking how it will look perfectly. Um, one uh, short comment. You, you talked about that censorship, like blunt censorship, that this site is blocked, is, is, would be a thing of the past. Um, and, and today kind of censorship is more subtle. Yeah. Uh, but of course, this, this is only true for us, privileged in North America and Europe, because I mean, large parts of the world's population are actually, I mean, they really experience these very blunt ways of, of blocking. I mean, think of the Chinese Great Firewall, think of Russia, think of Turkey, think of how in, in Sudan during the revolution there, the, the government just switched off the entire internet for the whole country for, the whole country for more, more than a month. So I, I guess there are many more countries like that. So, so this is also a reality which exists and which we probably shouldn't uh, forget about. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. Actually, West Papua was completely offline during during a during a big protest. It doesn't even make it to the media anymore. You know, like it, it has been normalized as well. That uh, before it, it would be like all the attention focused on those countries, and it's like you know, neglected. And I I agree that it's. It's simultaneous different forms of censorship. And one of the forms of censorship that uh, we don't discuss enough about it is the self-censorship of young people because they are so afraid that something that they said when they were 15 will chase them until they are 35 and applying for a job or a visa. Uh, it, it is getting, it's getting nasty. It's getting uh, in, in a time that we have the more tools than never before to express ourselves uh, is uh, is the time that we are speaking the li the least? Yeah. Okay, so we have one last question. I'm I'm from South Africa. Okay. I'm from South Africa, and I lived um, through apartheid in South Africa, and uh, I was 22 years old. I was at university in Pretoria, um, and I came to Germany for the first time out of the country and I heard the name Nelson Mandela for the very first time being here. I didn't know that he had been in jail as long as I had lived and <clears throat> that realization has been um, <clears throat> making it incredibly important for me to this conversation that you're having because um, the way the world is shaped, it's shaped through the choices that we make and um, if we choose to be uh, selfish, if we choose to just think of ourselves, um, ultimately the world is a really horrible place. And so um, I work in youth development in, uh, in South Africa, but I really have a, um, a passion for helping the 200 million young people in Africa that are unemployed right now, um, aged 18 to 24, to fulfill their potential. And I, I really believe um, that there's like one basic uh, principle in my life that I believe is really important for all of us, and that is that we must never be overcome by evil. We must always work to overcome evil with good. And so um, 
as an older um, Europe relative to a younger developing world, um, there is a lot of good that you can do if you start thinking um, with the question of how, which is what you were saying. Mm. It's not to say, you know, I'm, I'm not thinking of Robert Kiyosaki, you know, um, Rich, that poor dad where he says, you must never say, I don't have money. You must always say, how can I make the money I need? In the same way, we must never say, what can we do? Or, or, or we can't do anything just because we're old or we can't do anything because we're far away. We must start thinking, how can we make a difference? Because we need to change the world. Yeah. So thank you very much. I think that was a very necessary keynote and very necessary conversation in tech today, of course. Um, well, I think we can, well, I need a five minutes break after that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, 